So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Kalani Grossbechter. Uh, Gross Sorry. <laughs> Um, she is uh, going to be our biological vision speaker for today, which I think is a really wonderful tradition that we have for um, the Bay Area Vision Meeting. Uh, she's been an assistant professor at Stanford University Department of Psychology and Neuroscience Institute since 2001. Um, her lab's research uh, utilizes functional MRI, computational techniques, and behavioral methods to investigate visual recognition and high-level visual processes. She's a recipient of the Sloan Research Fellowship in Neuroscience and the Klingenstein Fellowship in Neuroscience. Um, I also discovered when I was looking around her website that she is also a brilliant painter in addition to her amazing work. Um, so help me welcome Colony Girl Specter. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for introducing me. I'm going to be the a neuroscience speaker for today, and I'm going to describe some work in our lab looking at uh, position-dependent uh, face processing in the human brain. Uh, much of this work has been done together with Rauri Steras, who uh, started when he was a postdoc in my lab. Now he's at Google, and we're still collaborating on this project. And also uh, together with um, uh, Kevin Weiner and Brian Mundell at uh, Stanford University. Um, so what I'm going to describe today is some bits and pieces about how face recognition might happen um, in the human brain. So we have an object in the world, for example, a, a person, and light bounces off that person and hits our eye. It then forms a, an image of that person, an inverted image on our retina, and then this information from the retina gets relayed to the brain. First, it gets processed as a subcortical nucleus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then transformed to the first uh, processing stage in the brain, the first visual area. It's called area V1. And then through a sequence of processing stages going from V1 through a processing stream uh, called the ventral stream going to the temporal lobe till uh, there is this realization that um, Maybe you recognize this face. For example, this is a face of Sergey Brin. And what we're trying to uncover as a group, uh, what are the computations that happen in the brain that enable efficient and robust uh, face recognition? Uh, now, much of these computations are still very mysterious to us, but I'm going to address some experiments that have addressed some basic uh, questions, and specifically, how are faces represented in the human uh, brain that enable efficient uh, face recognition? And specifically, uh, one of the issues uh, in terms of uh, face recognition is how does a visual system uh, deal with the variability in the appearance of the same object? So the appearance of the face will change depending on your viewing position, the distance of the viewer from you, or is the object from you, is the lighting, and so on. Yet recognition is pretty robust to these changes. And how uh, invariant uh, face recognition is accomplished is a question of central interest. In this talk today, I'm going to address only one aspect of uh, invariant recognition, and this is a, the question of position invariance. So the question is, what happens when the face moves in your visual field? Uh, how are these representations sensitive or insensitive to the position of the face in the visual field? Now, uh, a position in the visual field is actually very important in the visual system because there is a retinotopic map uh, in your visual system. So, for example, um, if you look at the world, there's a picture of a face. This is a picture of a Newton. Uh, this is how the face appears in the world. And there's a retinotopic map or topographic map of that picture uh, in your brain. So this is a picture um, of how that uh, face is represented in the first uh, cortical area or area V1 in the human brain. And there are a couple of things to note. First of all, adjacent points in the world map to adjacent points in the brain, and this is called a topographic map, or in this case, a retinotopic map, because it mirrors what's on your retina. Second of all, this image is uh, upside down. It's inverted. 
Third of all, uh, there's what's called uh, magnification, stuff that's close, close to the central part of vision is magnified on the brain compared to the periphery. Uh, and third of all, um, each hemisphere, V1 is in right hemisphere and left hemisphere, codes a contralateral visual field. For example, this is a right side of a V1, right visual, uh, uh, right hemisphere, and it sees the left side of the world. And the left hemisphere in V1 sees the right side uh, of the world. So if we think about representation in V1, we, uh, neurons have very local receptive field. Each neuron only sees a little bit of the world. Uh, and uh, together, this forms a picture that's very sensitive to the position of the image in the visual field. For example, if that picture moves a little bit in the visual field, that image on the brain is going to move uh, a lot. And this is why we think that this kind of representation is not very effective to enable position invariant, for example, face recognition. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, recognition uh, just begins in V1, and actually what happens in the brain is that there's a sequence of computation starting from V1 and ascending across a hierarchy. So this is a coronal slice of the brain, and this is an axial slice of the brain, and what I've colored on these uh, slices are the regions in the ventral uh, processing streams that are involved in object recognition. And there are a sequence of regions from V1, V2, V3, V4 um, that all have retina topic maps. And as we ascend this processing hierarchy, we know that receptive fields uh, increase uh, in size. And in the higher stages of this hierarchy, there are regions here that I coded them in red. And these regions are a more higher level in this hierarchy because they don't respond to any kind of stimuli. But these regions in particular are what we call face selective regions in that they respond more strongly to faces compared to a variety of other uh, objects. And we have three such face selective uh, regions in the human brain. One region is here in the inferior occipital gyrus, I call it IOG. Uh, then there are two regions in the fusiform gyrus, one in the posterior fusiform, and one more uh, anterior in the mid fusiform uh, gyrus. Um, and what we're trying to figure out is what kind of processing happens across this uh, processing stream that enables face recognition. Uh, if we look at the higher order areas of these processing uh, streams, for example, if you look at the activation from the mid fusiform gyrus, this activation here, um, uh, activation in this part of the brain is coupled with how people perceive objects. So what we do in these kinds of experiments, we put uh, faces very briefly at the threshold of recognition, and sometimes people can see them, and sometimes even though You've, you've presented a face, people might not recognize it. And what you find is that the activation of these areas increases as people recognize faces. So when you show a face and the person identify it, you see the red curve, there's a strong activation in this region. When you present a face and the person can tell you it's a face but cannot tell you whose face it is, you get some intermediate response in this region. And when you present a face but the person can't even tell you that there's a face in the stimuli, you get very low activation in this region. So what's kind of interesting about these higher order areas that they're coupled to your percept and you get higher activation as you uh, better recognize the stimulus as a face and you can recognize whose face it is. This is typical of this mid fusiform region, but you'll see a very similar profile of response in the inferior occipital gyrus. As again, you get activation in this region is coupled with how people perceive uh, or successfully recognize faces. This is different from low and intermediate level uh, regions of this hierarchy. For example, if you look at the signals from V4, which is an intermediate area, or back to V1, which is the receiving uh, area, the first region that processes uh, visual stimuli in the brain, uh, you can see that there's actually robust activation anytime you show a visual stimulus, but the level of activation does not predict what subjects perceive. So we think that these regions are more kind of processing the visual attributes of stimuli, and these higher areas might be doing something specifically that's relevant for face uh, recognition. So 
uh, how does this relate to a uh, computational model of phase processing? We like to think about the brain as some sort of hierarchical processing in that this hierarchy is built of several stages, and you can think about it as some sort of uh, neural network with multiple uh, layers. So this is a standard model. The first model of this kind was published in 82 by Fukushima. It's been uh, recently updated by Max Reisenhuber and, 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 and Jiang. And basically, you have an input visual stimulus. And there's a first layer, let's say, in your neural net that processes uh, local information. And V1 is known to code things like uh, edges in the visual stimulus. Um, and then you impose some nonlinear, and this network is very simple network. It just sums things up, and when you and when you move to the next stage, as it imposes some nonlinearity to create neurons that respond to more complex stimuli like um, junctions and angles. For example, uh, what's happened in V2, and also what happens as you ascend this network, uh, you have bigger receptive fields. So the receptive fields in V2 are bigger than the one in V1. And then these kinds of models uh, have a higher stage. For example, this is a stage of this network that's supposed to illustrate the inferior temporal cortex, uh, where there are neurons known to respond to faces. And these models suggest that there might be view to neurons as these neurons tune to whole views of faces. But one of the assumptions of these networks is that once it gets to the infratemporal cortex, uh, these neurons don't care about the position of the face in the visual field because it's supposed to respond to a whole face. So I'm going to illustrate some results in our labs that we actually wanted to measure how position sensitive these neurons are in the higher stages of this network. And second of all, since we found three face selective regions, we wanted to uh, characterize the properties of neurons in these different regions in terms of their position sensitivity. And in the end, I'm going to ba go back to this model and see how our neuroscience uh, measurements might inform and update this kind of hierarchical uh, model. So the goal of our experiments was to quantify the degree of position sensitivity in three-phase selective regions in the human temporal lobe. And as a method that we want to use is to use as a continuous measurement of position sensitivity across the entire visual field and to provide a quantitative model to describe which part of the visual field activates each fMRI voxels in the subject's brain. So what we do in these experiments, we put people in an fMRI scanner and show them a visual stimuli. Uh, they're going to see movies of a stimuli in our experiment. And as they look at the stimuli, we record brain activation across this whole sequence uh, of uh, brain uh, areas. So in order to sweep the visual field, we have subjects fixate, so we know where they're looking at. And then very similar to how Hubel and Weasel uh, measured receptive fields uh, in uh, cats, we just sweep the visual field with something that looks like this. It's an aperture that uh, continuously sweeps the receptive field. Again, remember the subject is fixating, and we're stimulating different parts of the uh, visual field. And this uh, bar basically indicates which part of the visual field is stimulated. Only except instead of showing a stripe of light, what the bar reveals uh, are faces. So basically, we have a field of faces. Uh, this field of faces gets changed uh, six times uh, in a, uh, every two seconds. And we have this bar sweeping across the visual field. So at every instance of time, it reveals parts of this face field, uh, as illustrated this, in this example. Uh, um, image. And the bar sweeps, as you see, from right to left, from top to bottom, uh, and so on. So that's our basic uh, stimulus. Um, and then what we want to do is, for each fMRI voxel, determine which part of the visual field activates uh, this brain. So basically, we have a stimulus, and we can record uh, uh, an fMRI signal from a voxel. and what we want to model is a part of the visual field that would predict this response. And our model of a receptive field is described by a two-dimensional Gaussian. And this Gaussian has three parameters, x and y, which describe the center of this Gaussian, and sigma, which describe the width 
of the receptive field or the size of the receptive field. And we're trying to find the best fit Gaussian that would predict our fMRI signal in every voxel uh, of the brain. So this is an example time course from a real voxel in the brain. So uh, the, this is the time. This is the signal that we measure from the brain. And the arrows on the top indicate um, the movement of the bar as it sweeps the visual field. The shaded area indicate when we have a stimulus that's on. Once in a while, we turn the stimulus off just to let the response settle back uh, to baseline. And the first thing that I want you to note is that during the shaded periods, the response goes on and off. And the reason that the response goes on, on and off is that some parts of the visual field stimulate this voxel and other parts of the visual field don't stimulate this voxel. So basically, we're getting position-sensitive modulation in this region that's supposed to be high-level uh, region. So what we do, we, uh, we search and we find the best uh, Gaussian that can predict the time course, in this case, the, what we estimate is a receptive field that's slightly off the center, and it's maybe about six degrees, and maybe prefers slightly the lower left uh, visual field. Once we have this um, a PRF, population receptive field, we can predict the fMRI signal from the voxels. So this is a black time course, shows a predicted response from this voxel, and you can see that there's a really nice close coupling between the predicted response and the actual response shown here in the dotted line from this voxel. Uh, since we're scientists, we like to repeat our experiments and validate our results. So basically, we run the experiment again, uh, and now we want to see if this uh, receptive field still predicts the second uh, set of data, and you can again see, see a very good coupling between the predicted response and the recorded response. And basically, these receptive fields explain a significant amount of variance uh, in our time course. So this is an example of voxels. We do this on every uh, voxel in each of our subjects and in each of the face selective regions that we record. And then we get pictures like this. So basically, you remember we have these three phase selective regions, the inferior occipital gyrus, the posterior fusiform, and the mid fusiform. And what you see here is the, is the, the part of the visual field that uh, is activated by each voxel. Each dot here represents a, a voxel in the brain, and this, the point here represents where the center of the receptive field is uh, in visual space. So a couple points to note. First of all, uh, as in lower level areas, the centers of receptive fields are contralateral. What do I mean? That uh, voxels in the right hemisphere will respond to stimuli in the left visual field, and voxels in the left uh, hemisphere will respond to stimuli in the right visual field. So this contralateral nature of response uh, is still present even in high level visual areas, and you can see this uh, laterality effects in each of the three a visual a face selective region. A second thing that's notable is that the cover of the visual field differs between this region and these two regions. So in the inferior occipital gyrus, you get centers both in the center of the visual field and more in the periphery. But as you go to the higher order stages, you can see that most of the receptive fields are actually close to the center part of the visual field. So they have more of a central uh, preference. Another way to look at these data um, is to take into account not only the centers of the receptive fields, but also the size of the receptive field. So basically, we tile the visual field according to the receptive field centers and their size, and we get a coverage map uh, of each area, basically saying which part of the visual field uh, each area basically uh, process. Um, and again, this illustrates this differential uh, um, coverage of the visual field across these three phase selective areas where the inferior occipital gyrus covers the entire visual field, and these regions of the fusiform have a, a coverage that's more uh, central uh, uh, in nature. Um, this is important to us because now if we want to model uh, these phase selective regions, we have a more precise model about which part of the visual field is and the receptive field sizes in these areas. And uh, furthermore, because we're getting different coverage maps across these three uh, regions, it suggests to us that these are three distinct stages that are involved in processing uh, phases. <laughs> 
So, so far we stimulated the visual field with faces. Uh, the question is, do you really need a face stimulus to drive responses in these regions? So the same way that we have the bar, bar sweep across a field of faces, we created another stimulus that we call the phase scramble stimulus. Uh, what we do is we take uh, the Fourier uh, transform as this image and we scramble the uh, phase spectrum and keep the same amplitude spectrum and create an image like this. Uh, this image um, preserves all the first order statistics of this uh, a picture as well as the amplitude spectrum, but of course you cannot see any face uh, in these regions. And this is just to uh, examine where, whether just the low level aspects of the faces are driving the, these regions, or maybe you really have to have something that resembles the face to drive responses in these regions. And again, we sweep the, the visual field with a bar aperture, and the a bar sweep is identical across these two stimuli. So all we're changing is the content inside the bars as the subject sees. It turns out that it really matters to these high-level areas what kind of stimulus you show inside the bar. If, when you show a, a phase scramble stimulus, you get very low signal in these regions, and you can no longer uh, kind of see clear position modulation or fit a, a population receptive field that explains to you which part of the visual field is stimulated by these stimuli. So basically, in order to drive these regions, you really need to have a face in the, in the picture and not only something that has the first order statistics uh, of a face. So what do we have so far? Uh, we find that uh, contrary to the prevailing model, uh, the higher order regions uh, of this processing stream, these face selective regions, are modulated by the position of faces in the visual field. But in order to see these position modulations, you have to use an effective stimulus. For example, if you're looking at face selective regions, you need to have a stimulus that has a face in it. And furthermore, we find evidence for three distinct stages of face processing in the human temporal lobe, which have differentiating differential um, uh, coverage of the visual field, where we find that responses become more centrally biased and less lateralized as you ascend the processing stream from the inferior occipital gyrus to the fusiform um, uh, gyrus to the posterior fusiform and mid fusiform. Uh, regions. Um, however, we were intrigued by the fact that we got differing results when we changed the content of the, the, the bar, and we asked whether the position modulation that we see in these rare areas might depend on the kind of stimuli that we use to map the visual field. So, so far, I've shown you a result with what we've called the scale faces. This is a center uh, stimuli. Uh, we've created two more kinds of face stimuli. One that's here, I think it's hard to see. But basically, this we created a field of faces with small faces that are uniformly spaced and are uniformly sized. And they cover the visual field. This was one extreme of our stimulus. And the other extreme, we use a, a single face. And in each case, a bar actually sweeps through parts of the single face, and the subject will see in each instance of time something that looks like this. So they'll see only part of the face as a bar sweeps across the visual fields. During the experiments, they'll see more than one face, more than one face field, um, but each time only a part of the face. What's important is that the, the bar sweep across these stimuli is identical across all these conditions. So if these uh, neurons in these high-level areas only care about where faces in the visual field, they care only about position, we should get the same response across all of these stimuli because the visual field stimulated is identical across all these movies. However, if the, if the neurons care both about what kind of face you're showing a, and where it appears in the visual face, a field, you might actually get differing responses a, a different position modulation across these uh, stimuli. In that case, that would indicate that the receptive field is something interactive because it depends both on about position and the kind of stimulus. So we first measured V1. Uh, if you look at V1 responses, each row shows you one of the stimuli. Uh, 
uh, and the dotted line shows the response from the brain, and the black line shows the fitted stimulus, and basically this is a receptive field that we measure in one uh, voxel. And V1 behaves like V1 should. Basically, it doesn't really care what kind of stimulus I'm showing, it only cares where in the visual field I'm showing something, and consequently we have the same responses across all three movies in V1, and we estimate very similar receptive fields for these different movies. So basically, responses of the V1 voxel only depend on where I'm showing stimuli in the visual field. If I look at the fuzzy form, something interesting actually ha happens. So this is again an example uh, of one voxel, and the dotted line shows the time course of activation from the brain for each of the different stimuli. And what you should note is that when I showed, when we showed the subjects the small faces, we get very punctate uh, and, and, and sharp modulation, but as we increase the size of the face, we get more prolonged modulation. What that means is that this is more prolonged modulation that it gets activated by a face in more positions across the visual field. And consequently, because we have differing brain responses to different stimuli, we get different estimates of population receptive fields from the same voxel because of the differing visual stimulus. So when we showed small faces, we get a small receptive field that is close to the center of the visual field. When we showed the, small, the scaled faces, we found that the receptive field becomes bigger and actually shifted more peripherally. And when we showed the large face, we suddenly get a really big receptive field that is even shifted more peripherally. So we get the surprising finding is that uh, in a region that was supposedly position invariant, it's actually not position invariant. It, in, instead, it codes both where in the visual field I present a face and what kind of face it is. So when we show bigger faces, it, it has larger receptive fields that are more peripherally shifted compared to when I show small uh, faces. So this is just one example of voxels, but we can do this analysis and across the population of voxels. Um, and this is basically the results I'm going to show you here. Um, here I'm showing you <coughs> <clears throat> all voxels from the mid fusiform region. Again, each point is a voxel. Here I'm showing you the estimated PRF size, population receptive field size, for the large faces uh, compared to the population receptive field size we measured from the small faces, and this shows the identity line. And what's very clear is that for large faces, we get larger estimated uh, receptive field compared to the small uh, faces. And furthermore, um, it's not only that they're larger, but they're also shifted more peripherally. So you can see that the eccentricity, like where the center of the receptive field is, is more peripheral uh, for the large faces compared to the small faces. So what I've illustrated for the single voxel is generalizable across a population uh, of uh, voxels uh, in the brain. So we summarize the results across uh, multiple regions and across um, all the pairwise comparisons. So we have the full field faces minus the scaled faces. We have the scaled minus the unscaled and the full field minus the scaled. And uh, there are several things to note. First of all, oh, everything looks like the same color. So the, the tall bars here are the face selective ROIs. And you can see that for all the face selective ROIs, when you have larger faces, you have bigger uh, population receptive fields. So the receptive field size scales with the size of the face. Uh, this bar here that's supposed to be black, this is the response from V1, and basically this shows you that there's no shift in V1. So early visual core, uh, regions don't have this uh, interactive face. They just tell you where the stimulus is in the visual field. It doesn't care about the content. But these higher level regions show a scaling of the receptive field size with the size of stimulus. And furthermore, the scaling seems to be bigger in the more anterior region and the mid fusiform regions compared to something that might be more intermediate in this processing stage, like the inferior occipital gyrus. So this is the effect of a size. Bigger faces produce larger a, a receptive field sizes. 
if you look at the cent location of the center of the receptive field size in visual space, it also gets shifted. Again, we have all these uh, pairwise comparisons. And again, if you look at the tall bars, these are the three face selective regions, you get a, a shift of the center of the receptive field. It becomes more peripheral as you show uh, larger uh, faces. And again, uh, V1, which is this bar, which is supposed to be black, um, shows no shift in the center of the receptive field. Um, so this is very uh, striking because it shows um, a modulation of the receptive field uh, depending on the stimulus in these face selective regions. So, so, so what does this tell us about uh, face processing in these higher order areas? So let's go back to our coverage maps that I showed you in the beginning. So each column reflects one of our face processing regions going ascending from the inferior to occipital gyrus to the fusiform, and each row denotes a, a kind of stimuli uh, that I show the subject. So across all of the stimuli, we get differing coverage of the visual field from the inferior occipital gyrus to the fusiform, where the inferior occipital gyrus behaves more like a, a visual field representation. It covers the entire visual field, and these regions of the fusiform tend to have a more central representation of the visual field. But if we consider this to be the higher stage in our processing stream, we actually see that the interactive effect of position and stimulus is actually larger here as compared to this intermediate stage. So it is actually the highest level of this processing stream that shows the, small, the, more, the largest sensitivity to both the stimulus content and the position in the visual field, which is actually really contrary to what you'd predict from a, a position invariant a model. Um, so let's tie this back to our hierarchical model of a uh, face processing in the brain. So I still think that a, a hierarchical model is a, a good model to consider when we think about face processing in the brain. But given recent results from our lab as well as other labs, I really think that this model needs to be uh, updated for several reasons. One, the initial model had only three stages, V1, V2 to the V4 and IT, and I think this is just wrong. So first of all, it'd be nice to actually include the right number of processing stages uh, when you put a model, because maybe this is important. So it would be nice to have V1, V2, V3, uh, V4 in our model, and not just two stages of low-level processing. Second of all, um, a lot of data suggests that there's more than one end processing stage of face processing in the temporal lobe, and at least in my lab, we find three processing stages, and these stages have different properties. So we would like to include in the model um, relevant data from our brains, actually looking at the specific properties of these higher order areas. Uh, you might note that I put a question mark uh, in V3 and V4 because we know a lot from the monkey work, is also human work, what happens in V1, also in V2. Uh, what happens in these intermediate visual areas is actually much less known, surprisingly, than these higher order areas. So we still need a lot of research figuring out what is represented in these intermediate visual areas. Um, other aspects of the model uh, sh should also be updated. For example, we can measure receptive field size, population receptive field size in all of these uh, intermediate areas, and this should could be used to constrain the actual receptive field size that we put in our computational model. Um, but uh, our, our model also has to account for these recent findings that we find a, an interaction between a position and kind of stimulus. Uh, and this suggests to me a, a different view of the representation in these higher level uh, areas. Specifically, it doesn't suggest a position invariant. It actually suggests a position sensitive representation, but it might suggest that there might be multiple neural population, each coding for different sizes of faces. So maybe there are some neurons that like small faces and some neurons that like large faces that covers a, a visual field. And when we show small faces, we're activating one subset of neurons. And when we're showing large faces, we're, we're activating a, a different subset. Uh, of neurons. So there might be multiple maps 
uh, in this piece of rain. And basically, is there some some place in the brain actually might say, oh, there's a face here, um, and that might be either from top down or from some kind of fast mechanism that goes from the superior colliculus, um, and then um, it, it either activates one of these uh, populations, or maybe there's some sort of kind of adaptive filter that can tell you first where the face is in the visual field, and then it adapts the size of your receptive field to optimize the recognition in this part of space where you think the face is. So if you think the face is big, you're going to adapt the receptive field to be bigger, and if you think that the face is far away, um, um, you might use a small receptive field, again, to optimize the computations uh, to the relevant part um, of the visual field. So uh, that's all for today, um, and thank you for your attention. Hello? Uh uh, we have time for uh, some questions, um, and Colleen, if you wouldn't mind repeating the questions for the video, that'd be great. Okay, fine. Yes. Okay, so the question is, how many neurons are in the voxel? So uh, it's quite a lot, uh, and it depends on the size of the voxel. So one cubic millimeter of the brain has about 50,000 voxel, uh, 50,000 neurons. Um, and the voxels that we're measuring here are anyway anywhere between one and a half cubic millimeters to three cubic millimeters. So you can multiply this and get an, a range of anything between 100,000 to a million neurons. Of course, all these neurons will have different properties. And this is why we call this a population receptive field rather than the receptive field because we're measuring the aggregate receptive field across a population and neurons. Things are nice for us in terms of mapping with the fMRI in that there is a retinotopic organization in the brain. That means that clusters of neurons that are adjacent in the brain will actually see adjacent parts of the visual field. So even though we, I cannot tell you what a single neuron sees, quote unquote, I, I, the population receptive field does represent the part of the visual field that's coded by this part of the brain across this population of neurons. Somebody else had some? Yes. Uh, this is a very good uh, question. So basically, the question was that in the full, when we have the full field, the bar sweeps across different facial features. Since the face is always in the same place, maybe we're getting this position sensitivity because some neurons like the eyes and other and neurons like the mouse. And I'm translating this featural sensitivity to position sensitivity. So. Um, we think that feature sensitivity can't explain everything, <clears throat> and the main reason is <clears throat> um, that there is a coupling between, um, even though there is, a, there is a shift in the preference of a, a particular voxel, a voxel that in the beginning were more foveal with the small faces are also more foveal for the big faces. Uh, so there's actually, a, a consistent shift across voxels. So when we show the small stimuli, that, that means that that voxel had to respond to a bunch of features uh, in, the fa in the face. So we, we think it has to do at least to some ex extent to position. It still could be that some neurons would prefer some parts of the face versus others. There are some results from Udi Zahari's lab in Israel that suggest that some neurons might like the top half of the face and other neurons might like the bottom half of the face, and they're also there in the fusiform gyre. So it might be a combination of both of these uh, features. Yes? Yes. Okay, so the question is, what happens if I'd actually show 3D stimuli instead of 2D stimuli? We've done a lot of experiments looking at invariant recognition across the human temporal lobe, 
And it looks like what really um, affects the responses in these regions is two things. One is the shape of the stimulus, and two, if the stimulus is recognized by the subjects. So if I show moving faces, or 3D faces, or line drawings of faces, or black and white photographs of faces, or colored faces, or movies of colored faces, I'm getting get pretty similar responses in these areas. Yes. So um, the question was, to show that the position modulations are face selective, I've compared the responses to faces versus face scrambled faces. But your point is well taken. This is unfamiliar stimulus. It doesn't have a shape. What if I use other stimuli? So just to remind you, the way that we defined uh, these regions to begin with, if I find it, um, is with something like that. So we compare responses to uh, faces compared to other objects. So this part of the brain I haven't showed you, but it responds about double to faces compared to other objects. Uh, we actually have done the, this experiment with houses as well. And houses do drive the responses in these rare areas, but not as much uh, as faces. And part of our research agenda is actually exactly asking the question that you're asking me, uh, and that is, do I get also changes in the receptive field size if I change the underlying category? So I need something that at least drives this region. Is the other really good stimulus for these regions? It's not as good as faces. It's something like uh, body parts, like limbs and animals. I know that there's going to drive these areas as well. And then the question is if I'm going to get the same modulation, and this is the subject of ongoing uh, research. Yes. Um, this particular experiment, uh, we've run only with frontal view of the faces. Uh, in other experiments that we've done in the lab, we looked at view invariance. Um, and it is the case that across all of these regions, is a representation is very sensitive to the view of the face. Uh, and frontal faces tend to produce slightly higher responses than profile faces. And backs of heads are not really good for driving responses in this region. Yes. So it's a very good point. So basically, uh, the reason that you look at people to recognize them is that you have the best visual acuity at the central part of the vision. And this starts already at your retina. Um, so it's true that you might notice a face uh, somewhere in the periphery, but if you really want to make sure that you know that person, you probably are going to point your eyes. And typical people will put their center of gaze somewhere here, which is pretty much the center of the face. Um, still, it is the case that sometimes that person will be far away from you. And sometimes that person would be close to you. And sometimes in a situation like this, there are actually a lot of faces all around you that actually might be crowding your face and actually might confuse me. So I actually might need to sharpen my receptive field to see only your face and ignore all the other faces that are really nearby right now hitting my retina. Uh, and I want to recognize that it's you. So there are a lot of situations, like you know, when I'm looking at the crowd, there will be many faces, and that might be an ecological reason why you might want to scale your receptive field for better face recognition. Right now it's still hand waving and we really need to do uh, experiments to look at this, but I think there might be ecological reason for that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I haven't told you, this is an experiment that I've done well, already seven years ago. Um, so basically what you do is that you put, so the person, he asked me a little bit more to describe the details of the experiment. How do I know if a person recognizes a face or they don't? So uh, we have all kinds of psychophysics tricks in our back, in our bag. And what we do is we put the stimuli very, very briefly, and then we follow it by this noise pattern, like a face scrambled image. 
and this masks the face. So basically, if you present um, stimuli, let's say for 30 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, sometimes people can see them uh, and sometimes they cannot. This is what I mean, stress level of recognition. So what we do, we put people in the scanner and show them a lot of faces very, very briefly. And so for example, uh, in this experiment we had, um, maybe they had to recognize Harrison Ford. So we had a bunch of Harrison Ford faces, we had a bunch of other male actor uh, faces, and then we had some scrambled faces. And then each stimuli flashes really briefly, and the subject has this uh, like keypad in the scanner. And they press one button and say, oh, this is Harrison Ford. They press another button and say, oh, I can tell it's a face. Uh, I don't know who it is. And the third uh, button, if, uh, they say it's not a face. So what, then we go back and sort our data, not accordingly to what we showed them, but accordingly to what they responded. So we have all the Harrison Ford faces, but sometimes they can see them and sometimes they cannot. And this is how we can get the signals that correlate to subjects per se. Yes. Okay, so, so the question is the following. Uh, I'm showing you these face selective regions, and these regions are indeed highly specialized. And the question is, is the specialization innate or is it learned? Uh, other experiments that I've, we're actually ongoing in my lab that I haven't described today specifically address this question because I think it's a really important question, especially like for machine learning, like do we learn about faces or we're born with faces? Uh, what we do in these experiments, we scan children. Uh, so we scanned school-age children, 7 to 11. We scan adolescents, 11, uh, 12 to 16, and we scan adults. And what we measure is the degree of face selectivity. We actually, there are other categories, selective regions of the brain. There are face selective regions and body part selective regions and object selective regions. And we actually see if the specialization develops over time. And one of the interesting findings from our lab uh, is that these face selective regions tend to develop the latest. So uh, you will find face selective region in children, but they tend to be smaller and less selective than in adults. And what's really surprising is that they still develop all the way into adolescence. It's intriguing because if you look at performance, kids don't remember faces as well as adults. So they might remember a small group of faces that they're highly familiarized, like they're you know, their kids in their school or their family. But generally, if you just do show them novel face and then ask them after five minutes to tell you if they've seen it or not, they don't do as well as adults. So we think that these areas, there might be some innate specialization, but we think that a lot of the selectivity is coming from uh, experience. So. so I think one more question. So you're asking what is the relation of the second experiment to recognition performance. In these experiments, we didn't really measure recognition performance in the scanner uh, because we really wanted to make sure that subjects fixate so we can map the visual field properly so they have a color fixation task. We did measure recognition performance outside the scanner. Uh, we didn't do like a person recognition, but a gender just to say if it's a male or female, and subjects can do it even in the periphery. Uh, but maybe if we had asked, is this Harrison Ford in the periphery, they couldn't do it. But we haven't measured it, so basically it needs to be found out. Thank you very much. Let's thank, thank the speaker. Thank you.